Um, good morning, everyone. And first, of course, I would like to thank for the opportunity. It's really an enormous pleasure to be here. And I thank both the Center for Global Education, Simon, and UNSW um, for the invitation. I have to say that you know, this would be one of the events that you would attend even if you wouldn't invite me, that I would attend even if you wouldn't invite me. And I think the, the introductory panel already has, has justified uh, uh, clearly that. And I thank very much our three inspirational speakers. And I think there is hope in higher education when we have leaders like the three that we've heard already this morning. So thank you very much. Um, it is, a, I mean, it is, of course, a very um, exciting task to be presenting Europe here at this time in the UK, but it's also a very daunting task because I'm summarizing what are 27, 28 very different situations, and, and of course I'll, be, I'll simplify a lot. And, and especially when we talk about higher education and education, which is so much um, mingled with, with political, historical, um, contextual factors, um, of course by drawing sort of general trends you are of course, uh, making very crude generalizations in some ways. But I'm, I will try to focus in, in, in two issues that I think are uh, very important and two trends that in some ways uh, pose significant tensions between each other, which is on the one hand in Europe, um, certainly continental Europe, we have had over the, uh, uh, over the last two, three decades significant trends towards, uh, significant forces towards integration um, at the European level, and in some cases even at the national level in terms of higher education policy, mobility of staff, mobility of students. Um, but at the same time, due to other developments in, in, at the national and at the supranational level, um, this integration has been in many cases driving towards growing inequality between institutions, inequality in terms of the quality of education that the students get access, inequality among staff, um, and tensions towards stratification both at the national and at the European level. And I think this poses, this relates to some of the things that have already been discussing, and I think this poses important um, challenges for, for European higher education institutions and for the debate in Europe about higher education. So without um, further delay, so this is um, in some ways, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I will just briefly go through this because it's sort of contextual um, elements that you know. Of course, we have had, um, normally we tend to associate many of these developments to the Bologna uh, process, but in a sense, as all important political events, these are uh, departures points, but they are also arrival points. So Bologna was the end of a process and, and, and converged towards what we call Bologna, both the Sorbonne and the Bologna declarations, um, a, a tendency across Europe towards greater integration and a willingness to integrate further and this led to develop in what we, uh, in, a, in a simple way, call the European education and the European research areas. Um, and, of course, these involve factors that are towards integration. They're also factors that um, restrict this integration. For instance, think about the regulations regarding labor market, spe specifically in terms of the academic profession, and how in certain countries this still are significant barriers towards mobility. Think about student support mechanisms, how they still very much focus in terms of national uh, logics and rather than, and, than European-wide uh, uh, in, integration forces. Think about um, um, social security, how this still poses difficulties in terms of mobility of staff, particularly academic staff. So this is the, the, the broader landscape that we're facing. And at the same time, in, I, I would focus very much in terms of the last 10, 15 years, there is a growing attention across Europe in terms of what is the position of their institutions, their higher education institutions, what's the position of the country in terms of the more global competition. And I, I think it's, that's a, a very important, um, of course, this, a lot of this is related to rankings and league tables. And, and the, the debate that has been relevant, and I think some of the speakers will talk about later on in this panel, about the sort of global visibility, the sort of world-class global institutions debate, um, as, as also trickled down in terms of European debates. This is particularly significant in the case of Europe. Why? Why? Because there was a tradition in many European countries of a very egalitarian approach towards higher education. So, higher education in particular, education in general, was supposed to be an equalizing force in society, a way of providing equal opportunities to 
people coming from very diverse socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. And, it, and this was aligned with a tradition in terms of policy where the state was a very strong regulatory force uh, and where the state attempted to treat all institutions very much in the same way, in terms of quality, in terms of the provision of education, I think in terms of uh, that some, in some countries some years ago, certainly before Bologna, um, the, most institutions teaching the same type of programs would have more or less the same curriculum. And this was the idea that regardless if you're attending you know, the main, a leading institution or well-known institution in the capital city or a regional university, you would be expected to be provided more or less the same type of education. So this debate about visibility, excellence, global visibility is increasingly a tension between this view of higher education from a egalitarian equality perspective and this tendency towards differentiation and, um, and selectivity analytism. Um, yeah. One of the factors that I think has been very important both at the national but then uh, making more congenial at the European level for these growing differentiation stratification is of course the financial dimension. I mean we've all know about the financial pressures that institutions face. And I'll just uh, highlight three trends that draw from a recent report that we've done together with UA and take the opportunity to congratulate Leslie for the work that UA has been doing in terms of building a common platform for discussion in Europe among higher education institutions. Um, and we do this, this was the defined project. If you just search on the web, you'll find plenty of interesting material. And what we've done, our center was doing a mapping study in terms of three major financial trends that we thought were relevant to explain the landscape in Europe. One was looking at the introduction of performance mechanisms in terms of funding. The second one, looking at mergers that were associated with financial incentives. And this is slightly different from previous waves of mergers that I will be talking in a while. And then the, the, the sort of this policy of focusing in a few of investing and concentrating resources in a few institutions in a small part of your system uh, which has been associated with the so-called excellent schemes uh, that are uh, as well familiar in, in, in other parts of the world. So when we look for instance at the performance system, why this is relevant in terms of differentiation because of course as we know um, these are relevant I would say in a, in a nutshell for two reasons. One is that in times of financial constraints if you don't have expanding budgets, by introducing different types of criteria, basically what you're doing is redistributing resources to some institutions to others. And that means redistributing resources according to certain criteria, and most of the, these criteria tend to be focused in terms of the stronger institutions. Stronger in what sense? Very often in terms of stronger, uh, in terms of their international visibility, in terms of their research reputation. So there is a certain idea of the preferred institutions that are supposed to be privileged underlying these criteria that have been introduced with performance funding. Uh, d d this just gives you a sense of how widespread is nowadays performance-based funding in Europe. Um, this has been introduced in different ways, either to, through formula funding or to performance contracts or performance agreements. There are some nuances there. I don't have time to go into detail. But I think already this gives you a sense that this is not a specific trend in one specific country, but it's really a broader European trend in north, south, east, west. Um, and when you look at the criteria that have been used, um, roughly you have had a, um, an a first step of introduction of formula funding, which was still linked very much to this idea of treating all institutions very much according uh, with the same criteria. This is very much back in the 1990s. When we move to the 2000s, increasingly, the criteria move from input to output and performance. And mainly, one of the aspects that has been particularly rewarded has been research performance and a certain type of research performance, which tended to play into favor uh, of the strongest international research intensive institutions. And this just gives you a sense, of course, we don't have time to go into detail, but that gives you a sense of two things that are important, and I think I've already, that underline something that I already mentioned. On the one hand, a broader trend. On the other hand, national differences is because you don't have exactly the same countries using the same type of criteria, but the broader trend is the one that I've just uh, described. Okay. Um, the second development that I would like to highlight in terms of financial trends 
is this idea of mergers. Um, why? I mean, in, in, many, in many countries this was not particularly new because you have had waves of mergers in the 1980s, the 1990s in, in several European countries. But usually these tend to be associated, this gives you just a sense of types of institutions that have been involved. You have various combinations of mergers having taken place over the last 10, 12 years in Europe. Um, but the interesting thing, uh, or the more interesting part, is, is this one. Whereas in previous waves of mergers in Europe, a lot of the process was steered politically in order to restructure sectors that normally were very fragmented of small institutions, very often associated with non-university sectors, so vocational institutions, very specialized. The, the novelty in recent uh, mergers, either uh, taken by the initiative institutions or promoted by governments, or the combination of both, um, was the fact that increasingly these mergers have been associated with international attractiveness, global relevance. So you have cases like Finland with Alta University, the merger of three institutions, that clearly was aiming at uh, uh, building an institution that would be visible in terms of international rankings. And I take that example as a sort of quite significant example because you're talking about Finland, Finland you're talking about one of the countries that's more egalitarian in Europe. So where even in those parts of Europe where equality is stronger, there's been an explicit uh, development both on the side of institutions and of the government to start differentiating. And this means not only in terms of reputation, but the funding associated with that. In the case of Alto, uh, it received a significant financial package from the government, and, and, and that was, there was a matching policy. So how much um, Alto was able to raise uh, from external sources, the government would bring um, um, a proportion amount of money. And which, in a sense, actually is also an illustration of something that we know at the individual academic level for many years, the so-called Matthew effect. And, and in some of these policies, one of the, the important dimensions of this, or one of the important effects, is, of course, you concentrate resources in a few institutions, and these are also the institutions that are more capable of drawing in terms of EU funding, as an aspect that Simon was already highlighting, and this creates a sort of cumulative virtuous um, um, situation for these institutions, but it, it makes much more difficult for the other ones to compete nationally and internationally with these institutions. Um, this, the, this links to the third development that I was already mentioning, which is the, the excellent scheme. So, I mean, these three policies in many ways have cumulative effects but in terms of favoring certain types of institutions within um, each national system and across Europe. These are just examples of excellence initiatives. Um, probably the best known, of course, are um, the one that has been taking place in Germany and in France. I, we don't have time to go into detail. Maybe um, in the discussion we have time to go back. But this again, I mean, especially by picking countries like France and Germany that have been, again, at the front front of um, social policy, uh, at a certain discourse um, of egalitarianism in education, taking this step is, is very important from a symbolic point of view. And I think that has also had an impact in the rest of the continent with other countries looking at this development and see how should we respond to this? Do we have the resource to do this? And if we have, um, you know, how many institutions can we afford to promote in this respect? Because, of course, not everyone will have the, the, the budgets that uh, you know, Germany and France will have to, to fund this. So altogether, I think this, this, this has been changing together with other factors that we don't have time to go into detail, but th this is focused on, on a pattern of greater differentiation in European higher education. Um, this differentiation tends to associate scale, visibility, performativity, according to certain criteria, very often linked to international visibility and, and research reputation and an idea that you focus on certain dimensions or certain missions of higher education, uh, um, in, and of course that means that you give less attention to certain ones. And I think that, that links to some of the things that we've been discussing in terms of the European landscape at large, and I think to a certain um, difficulty in European, of European universities to understand what is happening in society and to contribute to those debates. Um, I will... I don't think I'll have, um, probably only have like five or six minutes left, even 
Um, I'll just will complement this with what is happening in terms of Europe and how European policies in, to a large extent are reinforcing this national trend. Um, in, and, and, and they're doing this by, by, in a sense, by reinforcing inequalities that are already emerging at the national level and in some cases by bringing more to the surface uh, uh, um, a reality that in some ways existed already but that was refrained by a previous approach in European policies that try to promote cohesion and integration, and now it's more willing to promote a certain a few champions also in higher education and research. Um, this is actually from, um, this is a, just a, a, a short um, um, portrait of the presence of European universities in top 10, top 30, and top 50 times higher education ranking. Um, this is actually from five years ago, and, it, and it's on purpose from five years ago. I know that it's been published on an annual basis. But precisely because of the landscape that existed and it was perceived a few years ago, this explains some of the reactions that we've been seeing both at the European level and at the national level. So it is this perception. So this is already, I would say in some ways, an unequal um, uh, portrait. So you have a dominance in terms of the top 10, top 30, and top 50 of basically six countries. So the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, Germany, and Belgium. And then you have you know, more than 20 countries that have hardly any representative in the top 10, the top 30, and the top, uh, and the top 50 in terms of rankings. We will skip all the discussion about you know, how much these rankings are accurate in terms of portraying the reality of education. But this is a message that many institutional leaders and policymakers read. And they don't read the small print, as we know, about um, rankings and the nuances that higher education researchers are concerned. I mean, the same picture would be given by the, the, the Shanghai ranking again. And this is sort of the, 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 the message that, that has been very significant to many policymakers, not only in these countries where that I mentioned, like Germany and France, that has been willing to concentrate resources in a few institutions. But also, I think this has been a very important part of the debate in the parts that are not normally represented at the elite of uh, these rankings or the top of these rankings. Um, and this is even more significant at the European level because if you look at um, the trends in terms of funding, and again, I'm advertising the excellent work that EUA has been doing, in this case, the funding observatory. And they've, looked, they've been monitoring trends in terms of public funding. And when you look at this, especially when you look at the column in the middle, when the change in terms of public funding adjusted for inflation, you see that those countries that have increased significantly are mainly countries that are, you, you would tend to, to, to regard already as some of the richest countries in Europe some of the countries that have systems that are stronger in terms of public funding, like Germany, Denmark, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden, Austria, Belgium. And then you have a few exceptions. You have Turkey, of course, but that's a slightly different case because you have a country where a significant still expanding um, uh, young court and expanding system. So that's slightly different in terms of demographics from the rest. So when you compare in terms of enrollments, what is happening in Turkey and most of Western Europe, that's quite different. So that's, that's an outlier in that respect. Um, you know, and when you look at the decreases, you'll tend to find mainly Eastern and Southern European countries. There are you know, exceptions, but that's very much the, the rule. So in a sense, the trend in terms of pu public funding goes along strengthening already the systems that are already stronger and weakening the systems that are already weaker. And that, of course, when you talk in terms of an integrated European higher education area and research area, that is significant. This is another example, and it, it picks on data from FP7, the Framework Program 7, that ended in 2013, and it looks in terms of participation, participation number of projects, and again, the picture is not very even, it's very, actually, very concentrated. And what you have in terms of number of projects, and I could add in terms of the EU funding, you see that the, the, the sort of the, the portrait is very much similar between the two, and it tends to be very much concentrated where normally in terms of capital cities, so which it, it's also very often a, a source of contra a, a, a contrast between the rest of the country, and in the sort of uh, the north-west um, part of Europe. So, you know, there is this 
line that goes through the UK, north of France, Belgium, Netherlands, parts of Germany, um, and then gets sort of to Switzerland, parts of Austria, and north of Italy. And that's very much concentrates both in terms of networks and participations, but also actually in terms of the, the funding, the, the picture is even more dense um, in terms of this area. And you see that uh, the distribution of EU funding, even in framework program, which tended to be more evenly um, distributed, is, is very concentrated. And when you look in terms of um, participation at the institutional level, and, and this fits into what Simon was saying that I think are um, challenging issues for the UK and for UK education. How successful uh, um, UK institutions have been in terms of participating in FP7 and how much this I think will be a major issue and how important I think is for education institutions to uh, get involved in this debate about Brexit and the conditions that will uh, succeed in terms of science. And again, when you look at the top institutions, all of them are either from the UK, Switzerland, Belgium, the Netherlands, and then um, Denmark. So again, you know, very much polarized in the same countries. Um, when you look at the ERC grants, again, the same picture. Very often, we don't have time to go into detail. Um, I will leave the, the presentation in case you want to go, and, and I certainly recommend you to go into the reports of uh, ERC. I'm not questioning here, of course, the importance that ERC has had in terms of promoting uh, excellent science in Europe. What I'm raising here is if you don't have other, uh, the combination of other sources of funding that will complement these sort of funding that is targeted towards elite institutions and the strongest parts of the system across Europe, this will create, I think, a much more stratified uh, landscape. And I think I have to... Uh, this would be the distribution of ERC grants again, which mirrors very much, um, oddly or not, um, what I just presented about rankings again, the dominance of these six European countries in terms of uh, types of grants. Um, and ERC grants are even more significant to an, due to another reason, is that the mobility that is associated with that. And this, of course, is hard to challenge because you, you want to promote a sort of, um, that these researchers will develop their research according to the best conditions. But just to give you a, an illustration of that, even yesterday there was a press release about uh, seven Portuguese researchers were awarded ERC grants. Three of them are based in institutions outside the country and is yet to be seen if any of the other four will actually move to another institution because there is a very active, uh, in some ways I would say a very aggressive competition among European institutions for people that have been awarded. So it gives you a, a sense of... Um, I think the, of the point that has been raised. Um, so, you know, to sum up, uh, I think if you put together these two trends, both at the national level, that tends to emphasize certain types of performance according to certain criteria, the concentration of resources in a few institutions, either through mergers or by excellent schemes, together with this growing um, um, displacement of EU policies from more integrative redistributional uh, um, criteria to this more elitist view of funding of research and higher education. I think this is creating significant tensions across Europe. I think this is making much more difficult to have a common discourse about higher education, both at the national and at the European level. And at the end of the day, I th I'm not sure this will make higher education stronger. I think it will tend to weaken. There is a... Um, in some ways a zero-sum game in terms of the resources, but also in terms of the, um, the potential contribution of higher education to Europe that I think should um, um, require some attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pedro. And um, I'd never seen um, the lay of the land in Europe in higher education, so um, uh, that visual representation I thought was fascinating. Um, we've got time for um, a couple of questions before we open our next um, speaker, so please, questions from the floor. One at the back, yes, thank you. Yeah, um, Rob Copeman from the UCU Trade Union. Um, I, I, I understand your analysis and share it about the increasing differentiation around performance funding and 
and other mechanisms. But, but one of the things that hasn't happened is around tuition fees in Europe. Um, there hasn't been a, a shift, you know, perhaps outside the Netherlands, to increase fees or bring fees in. Um, and that's not just in the Nordic countries, that's in, in, on the continental, um, you know, Germany, France, and, and the South. I wonder if you could say something about that, about why that's the case, and um, whether there are likely to be any pressures in that direction yeah. to increase fees. Yeah. In some ways, uh, thank you for the question. In some ways, I think it underlines two things that I, I tried to raise. One is that how much higher education is linked to other social, it's so much socially, politically embedded. I think the fact that in some countries, some European countries have um, refrained from introducing fees, um, it's not so much a question of um, need, and, uh, but it's also, it's also very much a question of choice. And in some, especially in the Nordic countries, that has been the social contract, a contract has been that having um, free access uh, to higher education um, is part of that. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's, that's, that's significant on the one hand. On the other hand, um, you also see that those countries that have refrained from introducing fees or significant fees are also those countries that, on the one hand, have a more equal distribution of income and secondly, um, that also have a sustained high level of public funding. So, um, and, and, and I think this, this raises issues about really what we see as the role of higher education and in terms of the balance between private and social benefits and the private and social purpose of, um, of higher education. And I think part of the problem is that in some cases this course has been putting too much emphasis, I would say, in terms of the private benefits, um, which then I, I think has some impact even in terms of the differentiation. Because if you tend to associate uh, more and more the value of going to higher education to the um, income employability benefits, then students and families tend to be very, very careful in terms of the institution that they will choose, the, the, the type of degree that they will choose, um, the discipline that they are choosing. And these inequalities that we're talking about are not only, well, I've been discussing very much a sort of a macro level, but are also um, inside many institutions. When, when you look at the socioeconomic composition uh, of, um, of comprehensive institutions, you see that it's very heterogeneous in many cases. When you look at the socioeconomic composition of um, when you compare a sort of an elite research intensive university in a capital city with a regional university or with a regional polytechnic or vocational institution, again, this is very different. So um, the, 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 these um, inequalities are multiple and multi-level, and I think that, that's why I think we need to pay more attention because, again, the, the, some of the difficulty of uh, the higher education sector to understand so what is happening and, and a certain anger that exists in many of our so societies I think is related to the fact that we have been underestimating some of these trends and I think the inequality is, is clearly their major factor and the fact that higher education institutions to a large extent actually contributed to exacerbate those inequalities I think it's, it's a major issue. Thank you. Yes, the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. So to follow on that point, you talked about the stratification of the higher education landscape across Europe and the concentration of resources reinforcing that at a macro level. Um, just picking up on your last point, I'd be really interested in terms of the thoughts that you have in terms of what agency individual institutions have to counter that dynamic. Hmm. I would say that part of the discussion starts at home. <laughs> you know, I, I think part of the problem is that these tendencies towards differentiation and performativity are already very much inside the institutions. And, and I think one of the, uh, I would start by, I mean, of course, there is a debate that has to be ta uh, taken place at the national, at the European level, um, which I think will be difficult to reverse because I've, I've experienced that, that it's very difficult to come to argue this idea, for instance, you know, why it's questionable to reward people that are the best in their fields and the best institutions, because these meritocratic ideas 
are very much embedded also in the sort of higher education ethos to a large extent. But there is also uh, um, a discussion to be uh, had uh, inside the institutions in the sense of how do you sustain a certain idea of university by supporting different disciplines? And, and part of the, the, I mean, part of I think of the misunderstanding is that some people think that you can have this kind of context and that higher education institutions will still be insulated uh, from, from that. And I, my impression is quite uh, the, the contrary. I think that the, the competitive factors have been so much uh, around that are now very much embedded in all the discussions about, for instance, distribution of budget inside institutions and about the growing differentiation in terms of staff contracts and staff rewards. Um, so I think first we would have to sort out some of these issues inside the institutions and be able to practice what we then will ask uh, governments and, and the EU to do. And, and part of the problem is that we're doing some of, the, some of the university leaders and some of the academics are saying this, but then in their own institutions they are replicating exactly these type of things. And I think part of the ineffectiveness of the discussion is precisely due to that. Thank you. I think we've got time for um, one more question. Um, and if we could be um, brief because we are slightly behind schedule. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro, for, for giving this perspective, um, especially from the South. I'm also following your prior publications. I've looked at data for the ERC. And if, for instance, if you look at Italy, I mean, I think that proportionally Italy has lost much more than what potentially the numbers we're looking at for, for Brexit. I mean, and my country is one of the countries benefiting from that. Mm -hmm. You could see that we are around zero in, in terms of uh, the budget, the, the public funding side, and we're growing the performance of the system. That's thanks to those mechanisms. Yeah. That is really thanks to those mechanisms. There's a lot of uh, Italian ERC grantees in, in our universities, for instance. But it also uh, helps us to, to realize, I think, that we look, need to look at flows and not at national statistics. We need to look at flows. Um, and in relation to that, I would question your, your uh, point on, on is it a zero-sum game? Is it a zero-sum game? If we look at it in terms of flows and in a global context, I wonder um, what your thoughts are about that. <laughs> You're an economist. Um, I think, of course, you have differences there because in some cases, as we, we've seen, there were increases in the, the, both in the public but also in other sources of funding that were brought into higher education. In that case, I would suspect that you know, uh, the level of funding of even the weaker institutions was maintained. I think it's very different in the case where you had funding cuts or when you had the sort of um, um, no growth despite, for instance, changes in enrollment. And in that case, if you change the criteria according to what you, you distribute funding, necessarily if you don't increase it, it just means either this, you're just pretending, and it has happened in some cases that you, know, you say, well, this would be the distribution if we were to apply performance criteria, but because this is not politically viable, we'll just moderate these effects. So the, um, but even already by doing this, and I've had that experience, for instance, in my own country, both at the system level and at the institutional level, that once, even if you do the exercise, just for the sake of doing the exercise, you already instigate a sense of disunity that then is very difficult to rebuild. Because if you just do the exercise, say, well, this would be the allocation of funding according to certain performance criteria, but of course we cannot give all this money to the Faculty of Medicine or the Faculty of Engineering, because otherwise natural sciences and humanities would go bankrupt. Um, but already this plants the seeds of um, uh, revelry and, and, and weaken a sense of institution and university that you need to have. Um, and again, I think this brings back to fundamental questions about you know, what are we as institutions? Are we just a sort of collection of uh, group research uh, or individuals or departments? Or are we more than that? And, and, and the answer to this question is not linked only to performance according to certain criteria, as to do to the public mission that we are supposed to, to play. And I think by, because we, we tend to forget this when we go into the 
<laughs> important things of money and research and so on. Uh, we just leave it to the annual ceremonies and so on. Um, I think that's, that's part of the problem. Um, and as we know, this is always difficult to um, practice what we preach. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question.